Uh, Pastor, um, Pastor Bill has, uh, is doing a series on uh, trusting God and being anxious for uh, nothing. And uh, he, uh, he actually broke it up in, into sections. He uh, asked John to share and myself to share. And uh, I was asked to speak on focusing and putting our focus on Christ. And uh, we're going to be... Uh, sharing from uh, Hebrews chapter 11 today, uh, chapter 11 and the first couple of verses of chapter 12. And uh, for those of us that know chapter 11 in, in Hebrews, that's the chapter on faith, okay? That's what they call the heroes of faith or the whole of faith. It has several titles. But basically, when you read that, it's a roll call of all the Old Testament saints that uh, that have shown the mighty faith and how God used them and how they were able to do miraculous things in the Lord. And uh, and you read, it's like, wow, it blows, it blows your mind. It's just one after another. And, uh, you know, that, and that's the point. Um, but as I, as I was reading this and preparing, um, I, I, you know, I, I was thinking about myself because I, I'm reading this and I'm thinking about myself and as I grow as I grew as a young Christian to where I am now, who were the influences in my life, you know? And, um, and when I, as I kept reading this, there's one in particular person that just, uh, this man has been such a big impact in my life because, you know, God has, you know, he, he put this, these people in this chapter so that we can turn to them and use them as examples on how we should live our lives. Um, but uh, there's also people in our lives that we can look to and they help us and help us grow and that we can, you know, we should be able to emulate in our personal lives. And one of the persons that came to mind was, uh, was an old pastor from my old church. And uh, his name was, uh, I don't know, who's, who here came from First Spanish Baptist for sake? So you guys know a pastor Fraguela, right? His name is Rafael Fraguela. And he's, he's probably the person who's impacted me the most in my Christian walk. Uh, when I came to know Christ, you know, and I, and I wanted to serve in ministry, uh, I was asked to serve, you know, in youth ministry. And they were just, and it's it just ironically, uh, they started Bible classes at the church there. You no longer had to go to New York. And the, the teacher there was the pastor, he was a retired pastor. He started coming to our church, and he uh, he uh, he actually was uh, became a member of our church. And the person who was a pastor of our church at the time was one of his students when he when uh, when he was growing up. So he 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 became he was a professor. So we used to go there Tuesday nights and Thursday nights uh, for about three hours, and and he was they were a tag team. It was him and his wife, and they would. Uh, and they would teach, you know, each semester they would teach something different, you know, he would teach different books of the Bible, how to preach, how to, uh, you know, um, uh, she, she taught me Christian history and, and she actually taught me how to direct, you know, I learned music. And uh, but then after we're done, we would have to put all this stuff into practice, you know. But I, I just remember watching him and how he would just have a love for the Lord. And, you know, this is an older man and how he... He, you know, he was always studying, and how he, uh, I, I always watched the way he treated his wife. He, he loved his wife, and I remember, you know, they were, one would teach, and then, you know, would take for about an hour, they would, would take a break, and the other one would teach. And he was always close by, because when she needed something, not by her, and he, he would jump to his feet, and, and, and I tell you, these people have been married for over 50 years, and he would just go serve his wife, and whatever she needed, he would take care of her. So I, I always watched him. I says, you know, I, and, and you know, the, my love for the Lord and my uh, love for the Word and for the teaching of the Word, you know, came from watching him. And he, and he was actually, actually, was a, a person that I tried to copy. You know, he was a very small man. I remember when he was preached, he would stand on his toes for about. 45 minutes, I, I was watch, and, and because he was so short that the podium sometimes was would cover his face, so he would stand on his toes. And um, but I, I, no one has left an impression in my life as much as he has. And one thing I learned from him is that you know people watch you. People are always watching us, and uh, 
And if we're looking for the Lord, and, we can, and like I said, for example, if I'm standing up here preaching the Word of God, I better be living it. Because people are watching me. And uh, if you want to or don't want to, you're going to be an example to somebody, good or bad. And uh, you know, I, I just wanted to share that because, as I said, he was very instrumental. And, and when I read this, that's what I think about. That's what the author's doing. He's, he's is telling the Hebrews and teaching them about the Old Testament faiths and how faithful they were and how God used them and, you know, and, and, uh, and using them as an example. Um, so um, with that, I'd just like to open up in a word of prayer and then we'll go into the word. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for all the blessings you've given me, Lord, for my wife, my children, my family, Lord, uh, for my salvation, Lord, and just the, the fact that you love me, Lord Jesus. Uh, I pray for this congregation, Lord, and I pray for their hearts, that they may totally be devoted to you and your, your word, and that they may learn to live uh, by your word. And uh, just I, I pray, Lord, that uh, our focus in life may be you. I pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn our Bibles up uh, to uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 11 real quick. And I want to read the first couple of verses and start off with, the, with that. Amen. All right. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. For by it, people of old receive their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen is not made out of things that are visible. Okay, um, first thing I noted, and, and this is somewhat a small definition of what faith is. There's more involved in it, but it gives you a running definition of what faith is here. And uh, there's two things, two parallels here that you need to pick up on when you want to understand faith. First, uh, faith is assurance, okay? Um, the word, you know, assurance in the Greek means hopotasis, okay? And it's a word that if you turn to Hebrews 1.3 real quick, is used in Hebrews 1.3. And the word exact imprint is the word hypotasis. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Okay? Same word. Also turn to chapter 3. And um, take a look at verse 14. For we have come to share in Christ if we indeed, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. See, my faith is assured in the fact that, I, that my feet are on solid ground when I believe in Christ. I'm sure and I have confidence that Jesus Christ is who he claims to be. My, you know, I, I am totally surrendered to, you know, to, the, con to the truth and I am waiting for the fulfillment of the truths and the promises of Christ. Okay? I'm sure of that. Okay? And a lot of people say, you know what, I believe in Christ. Awesome. But there's a second part to this verse. If you keep reading, it says, of the things hoped for. Now, faith is the assurance of the things hoped for. The conviction of the things not seen. Okay? The word conviction here is a similar word to the short, but it's more, okay? Uh, the word conviction here carries the same truth, but a bit further, because it implies a response, an outward manifestation of the inward assurance that I have. Uh, the person of faith lives his beliefs. His life is committed to what his mind and his spirit are convinced is true, okay? Um, I'm gonna give you an example. Uh, take a look at verse number seven. Verse number seven, um, speaking about Noah. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world 
and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. Okay. Now, the example here is that Noah uh, was told by God to build an ark. Okay. What you, what, what some of you may not, um, might, might not know is it's never rained before. Okay. It's never rained before. He's told by God to build a boat, a big boat. Uh, I'm sure he's never built one before, so he didn't even have the capability of doing it. Why would anyone build an ark, right? Um, so, but when God told Noah to build the ark, what did Noah do? He built the ark. And it took him 120 years to do so, but he built it. The thing is, his faith in God um, he believed and he was sure of what God said, but he also took that and made it a conviction and he actually carried out what God had told him to do. And that's, I guess, where a lot of us, and sometimes I myself, fall short. You know, we know what to do, we know what the Word says, but we have trouble, and maybe it's because of lack of faith, carrying out and living it out and uh, being obedient to God in that sense. But, uh, you know, the world. And I think about this, you know, and it, when you look at the ark, the ark is a picture of Christ. And when you look at it, uh, is didn't Noah preach for that time, it, or was he very secret? Did he build, build, build did he build the ark in a shed hidden from everyone? No, it was out in the open, and he was telling people, you know, about what was going to happen. And, um, and and you know what, they, they didn't believe him. Okay, but the only way to salvation at that time was what? Through that door, okay? He had that one door, and he was preaching that they may come in through that door, and if they came through that one way, they would be saved, all right? Um, sadly, nobody believed, except for him, you know, him and his family, and uh, only eight were saved, so. Um, <coughs> Noah is an example of faith and action. Um, if you take a look at, um, Verse number 27 in chapter 11. It reads, by faith, it's talking about um, Moses now. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Okay? See? Those of us of faith can see the invisible. And that's the problem with the world. The world can't see the invisible. So when we say we're going to do something or live for Christ or, you know, we're giving our money to Christ and, and we're all sold out for Christ, the world thinks we're crazy. Okay? And they, uh, they don't want to believe what we believe because they're blind to the, the invisible that we see in God. Okay? Okay? Um, now let's go back to verse number six. Verse number six makes it very clear. And without faith, it is impossible. But what is that? Impossible to please God. All right? To please Him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists, that He rewards those who seek Him. See? Those of us that believe draw near to God, you know. We draw near to God when it comes to our devotional life. We draw near to God when it comes to our time with God and a personal, uh, the, uh, the personal devotional life with God. And um, we also believe that God exists, correct? You know, believing is just not saying, I know it's true. Believing is, again, I believe it, so I live it, okay? And um, it says there that, those of us that do believe uh, will be rewarded, okay? Um, again, not all of us see these rewards in this lifetime, okay? Not everyone that's a believer um, is blessed financially. Not everyone that, that's a believer receives monetarily gain. Not everyone, you know, has a nice house, a nice car. But uh, remember, as a believer, where's my ultimate reward? It's in heaven, right? Hey, and that's what I live for. See, my focus, my focus is Christ. My focus is on the finish line and what I ultimately will be in Christ. 
Um, the life of faith is the only life that pleases God. See, this brings us to two pitfalls that we must address before we can apply this passage. Okay? Um, the first pitfall we need to address is that I am no hero. Okay? Affected. A lot of us believe, you know, I'm not a hero. I'm not, I can never be like these people in the Bible. You know, they're in the Bible. You know, they're, they're, they're greats. They're, God, you know, God mentions them there. How can I ever compare? You know, and we tend to do this. We try to compare ourselves and put ourselves in comparison to the people in the Bible and think that they're greater than we are. And what we need to understand is that um, they're men and women just like we're men and women. Okay? They just happened to live a long time before we did. Uh, but the reason that they're pit, put here is that they're, just, they're men and women, just like we're men and women. They have flaws, and I can go down a list of flaws of every single person that's mentioned here. Um, but they have flaws like we have flaws. Um, the difference is that they uh, put their faith in God and, and believed who he was. And um, was, were, you know, again, believed him. And we're convicted by that truth. C.S. Lewis put it this way in his book, Mere Christianity. The author of Hebrews' whole program is to call struggling, sometimes bumbling Christians into a life boldly by faith. He calls us with all our habits and hang-ups, warts and worries to action. We are called to step up and step out with the world step out of the world, hop up on the stage of history and take our place in God's roll call of the faithful. Of course we are inadequate, but so have been the others who have evidenced the grace of God. If it would not, if it was not, it would not be called grace. Okay? And we're only able to accomplish what we accomplish through the grace of God. The second misconception is, uh, excuse me, the second pitfall is the misconceptions of faith, okay? I have, I have four that I put down, uh, two that are basically believed by Christians and two mo mostly by non-Christians. The first one, first misconception of what faith is, is that there is, that there is faith seen as faith in God's goodness to me, okay? And uh, this is an expression that can be found in today's health and wealth teachers, okay? Um, you know, not every Friday is a Friday, if you know what I mean. We, we you know, we, we, uh, we as believers, you know, what, what happens is a lot, there's a lot of people that believe that if I am a person of faith, I should have much wealth, and I should have uh, much blessing, I should have no sickness. And they believe that a person that, that does not have these things is a person that lacks faith. And that's not what this is, that's not what the scripture teaches, okay? Um, again, you see the examples in scripture. Um, not all the men that were on this roll call of faith lived, okay, because of their faith. In fact, a lot of them died because of their faith. Um, so um, being a man of faith does not guarantee a, a successful life. It does not su uh, guarantee a life of plenty. Uh, it just it just guarantees that uh, we uh, that we are children of God and that our focus is on God and that someday we will uh, eventually receive our eternal heavenly gift of salvation and spend eternity with God. You know, and that's what I look towards. Um, anything else would be uh, it would be. Uh, Myself and my flesh wanting uh, and desires wanting uh, material and materialistic things. It doesn't mean that material things are bad. Again, God sometimes blesses us with them. Uh, and it's not bad and it's not wrong. It's just who is your focus? What is your focus? Okay? Uh, second uh, misconception is that uh, faith involves. Oh, well, well, at times, faith is misunderstood and summed up as faith equals creed approach, okay? There's a lot of people that uh, believe as faith is what you believe, okay? If this is what you believe, that is your faith. And it's basically strict on doctrinal uh, teaching, but without uh, evidence of living it out. 
Um, you know, the Catholic Church is really big on that, you know. It's what you believe, it's not really how you live. It's just really determined on how you live your life. Let's turn to our Bibles then, to really quick to James chapter 2. And I believe this, this uh, James chapter 2 really answers that question. Is faith only what I believe? Let's turn to James chapter 2, and I'm going to start reading from verse number 14. Amen. Amen. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking the daily food, and one of you says to him, Go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is it? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his work. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. See, my faith is shown by my action and how I live my life. Uh, the third misconception is some can misunderstand faith as a blind leap into the unknown. And if, uh, if you uh, read the book of Genesis, you'll notice that... Uh, and if you study, you know that the Bible teaches that the world was created in how many days? Right? Six days? Seventh day he rested. So, seven days altogether. Now, are those days literal? Or are they millions of years, like scientists teach? See, faith teaches me that the, what the Bible says, I believe. Okay? If my God is sovereign and my God controls and my controls the world and my God created this world, don't you think He had the ability to create the world in seven days, the power to do so? See, the scientists of today will tell you that's not true, and they'll try to disprove it with theories after theories. They don't even believe in their own theories. If you, if you listen to all the other theories, are different. But I see the thing is, I believe in the truth of God by faith. Just like Noah, when people think I'm crazy, and people think I'm nuts for believing what this book teaches, I still believe the, I still believe the Word of God, you know? And it doesn't matter what the world may think, what the world may say, um, I believe that if anyone is living a blind faith, it's them. Because my faith is grounded in Christ and a person. Um, their faith is really uh, founded on what they think and what they think might be true. It's a theory, uh, but my you know my faith is founded on God's word, and uh, I will put this against anyone any day. Uh, this is this is God, the Creator of the universe, uh, who's speaking. Again, does everything I read make sense all the time? No. Do I understand the Word of God all the time? No, none of us do. Um, but one day we will. Um, again, you look at the Old Testament say, faith, uh, saints. Do you think Noah understood everything that God wanted him to do? No. But he was faithful. And he, he had faith that God had his right in mind for him, and he did it. Um, it paid off, didn't it? <laughs> but, uh, let's think about it. Uh, fourth, still another understands faith as a life of reflective devotion to any good one, uh, to any, just, uh, I guess, any religion, um, any faith. These are people that, that understand faith as a life as reflective. Uh, you know, you can be a Buddhist, you can be a Muslim, you can uh, you know, worship Christ, you can worship where you want to worship, you can worship this piano, this rock, it doesn't matter. You're a person of faith, and your faith is 
based on what you focus on. And no faith is wrong or right. And you know, this is not what the scripture talk discusses. This is, not what, this is not the type of faith that the Bible talks about or teaches. So we need to understand that these misconceptions that the world have and teach about faith are not the same that we believe and understand. Uh, let's take a look at faith as defined by Hebrews chapter 11 really quick. Uh, first, faith involves confident action. Most of the examples found in Hebrews 11 involve a person acting confidently in accordance with the, what God says. By faith, Abel offered to God a superior act, um, sacrifice. Noah built an ark. Abraham obeyed by leaving familiar territory. Uh, and later, um, Isaac. Isaac blessed his sons. And one of those sons blessed Isaac's grandson. And the list goes on, okay? Faith acts out in bold confidence. Second, true faith is action taken in response to an unseen God and his promise. Faith rather than merely stagnant belief, spurs one to act in accordance to God's truth. His boldness, however, seems especially to do, to do with the fact that these great people of faith are backed by the unseen. Third, faith involves working extraordinary miracles in the <coughs> lives of ordinary people. Okay? God can do extraordinary with the ordinary if your heart is His. That's how he likes to work. Um, he doesn't always use the great speaker or the, or the rich person or the person that's well educated. He uses the people that you would less, least expect, expect just to prove that he is God. Okay? Um, take a look at this Noah, for example. You know, it's funny because he, he, he chooses us even with our issues, because we all have issues, okay? And we all make mistakes and we all sin. But take a look at this. Noah, for example, got drunk and lay naked in the tent. Abraham lied about Sarah, which John mentioned last week. Isaac lied about Rebekah. Um, Jacob was a deceiver. Moses committed murder. And the people of Israel were a bunch of ungrateful grumblers. Gideon, a doubter. David, an adulterer and a murderer. You may think that the author of Hebrews is stretching the truth here a little bit by holding these people as an exemplary in, in their life. What we need to understand is that faith needs to be lived out by real people, okay? And real people ain't perfect people, okay? And none of us here are perfect people. Um, fourth, faith works in a variety of situations, okay? Um, we have an offering, a transportation to heaven, a building of a boat, a movement of a family, the ability to have a child, obedience to the offering of that child back to God, the blessing of the children, seeing into the future, the find the authority, the choosing of mistreatment above pleasure, the keeping of religious ordinances, and suffering persecution, and just so on. Okay? God works in many ways. Fifth, biblical faith may not have a variety of outcomes though, okay? The outcome of our faith may not always be good, like I said before. If you notice, uh, some outcomes are positive, okay? Um, for instance, in Noah's example, there was a positive outcome. But there's also negative outcomes. Abel, for instance, was faithful, but Abel still died, correct? So the outcome of our faith isn't always positive. Does that, should that prevent us from being anxious and trusting God? No, that's what faith is. Trusting Him because that's what He wants us to do and because we love us, because we love Him. And again, our ultimate goal is not to live as many years as we can in this world. Our ultimate goal should be what Christ wants us to do. That should be why I live and what I get up for every day. You know? different mindset because if you're living for Christ you might deal with difficult times if you live for Christ you might be ridiculed if you live for Christ you know you see the example overseas you might have to die for your faith you know and then I, I, I had spoke to you about my uh, about my uh, Bible teacher uh, Pastor Fraela one thing I didn't share was that you know and one of the, probably, probably one of the greatest reasons why I really uh, admired him was because even under persecution, 
he was faithful. Now, this is a man that lived in Cuba as a pastor when Fidel Castro took over. And when Fidel took over, um, he, uh, you know, he religion was was banned. Okay, and uh, they had to renounce and any pa all the pastors were round up, and they had to renounce Christ. And if they renounced Christ, they were set free. And he refused to do so. And uh, you know, this man served seven years, six years, six years in prison because he wouldn't renounce his faith. And uh, I don't think the, the the jails over there are as nice as here, especially with a little you know little fellow like you know. I could just imagine how hard it was, and how easy it would have been just to say, you know what, you know, I, I, you know, say what you have to say to get out. I don't believe you know. You could say I don't believe it in my heart, but his conviction again, he was assured of his faith. But it was carried out in the conviction that when tested, he stood up for what he believed. You know, and my prayer is that if I'm ever in that position, that I may prayerfully, act, you know, behave in the same manner. You know, that's why I need to continually focusing on the Lord and growing in Christ. So, and, and then when I'm being tested, I, I need to make sure that I'm, I'm doing what's right by Christ and continually grow and be and be honed so that when the tough times come, I'm ready. Okay, those of us that are living a relaxed life and aren't really living our faith, when tough times come, you're going to crumble. Okay, uh, higher faith, scripture says, is rewarded by God. That's the sixth point. Faith is rewarded by God. Take a look at chapter uh, 11 again, verse number 2. Verse number 2 says, For for by it, the people of old receive their commendation. Now take a look at verse number 39. He starts the, he starts the chapter with this and he finishes with this. Chapter, verse 29, he says, 39, excuse me. All of, and all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. See, our reward is a commendation. Well done. Well done. Uh, right? Well done, good and faithful children. Um, that's our commendation. Uh, we are rewarded by God. Uh, I am blessed so much, and I'm just so thankful for who He is and what He is in my life. You know, and because I just shared a lot of information, from, you know, from the chapter 11 and uh, and some examples there. But the thing is, how do I take this now and make it real in my life? See, the thing is. Thing, with, thing that he's trying to do is he's giving, you, he's giving you all these examples so that you can make it real in your life and apply it to your life. And you find the answer to that in chapter 12. If you look at chapter 12, it teaches us how I can live that faith. Um, let's take a look at chapter 12 and let me read verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Look into Jesus, the founder, the perfecter of our faith. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised into shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen, right? Now, if you, when you read this, first thing you see is there's an analogy here, okay? He, um, and, and again, I may not look it, but I used to be a runner, okay? And so, uh, I ran, I ran uh, for many years. I, I started running in high school. I, I actually started running in eighth grade. And uh, I was very good at it. I was, uh, I was running varsity in my freshman year. I, I, I used to wrestle also, but I gave up wrestling because I, I enjoyed running. I became a very good uh, half miler and miler. The mile was my best race, but I ran you know two mile race also, and I ran cross country. I was good at that, but I was really good at the mile race, and uh, I would always I would always place first or second, um, and I would, you know I would always run against the better the better runners in the in the, the other schools, and uh, again, man, I'm, believe it or not, my best time my best, I still remember my best time as a as a miler was four minutes and 35 seconds okay and uh you know that's for me you know that you know I, I ran consistently on the five but that was my best time and i was actually offered uh 
four-year scholarship to run and uh, run in school. But um, again, I was at a time in my life where the award wasn't important, and uh, my lifestyle was a little different. And uh, I turned those things down. And uh, again, I I learned things in life the hard way. Okay, and um, um, but the analogy of the racer here is something that I can relate to. And as I, you know. Again, when I'm reading this, I, I think about all the things that, uh, that, that, that goes into running. You know, first thing you, you realize here is that there, it, says that, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. But the key to the verse is, let us run. See, let us run. The race endures. Let us run. See, in order to be a person of faith, you have to be in the race. Okay, if you're not in the race, um, you're you're ready, you're ready out. Okay, you you have to be in the race. As a as a you know, if you're not if you don't know Christ, you're not in the race. If you do know Christ and uh, you're sitting on the sidelines, you're not in the race. Okay, you need to be in the race. Um, as a runner, you know. You need to be, and, 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 and your challenge and, and your, your desire is to be in that race. Um, now, knowing that I'm going to race, there are certain things that I need to keep in account. So, and just want to make a quick point. When you look at the first part of the verse, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, that verse isn't saying that these people in, in, in chapter 11 are watching us run the race, okay? But it's saying that these are people, are examples that we should take and live by, okay? Um, see, I'm going to run that race. How do I run that race? These are some of my examples. How do they run their race, okay? Um, first thing I need to do, though, before I run, is let, let us lay aside every weight, okay? What is that talking about? See, as a runner, when you run, you see, ever see runners on TV, uh, when they run, they have sweats on. Do they, ever, do they ever run the races with their sweats on? No. Why? Because the object of the race is to win. And when you win, you win when you have the least amount of weight on, and uh, you have the least amount of friction, and even aerodynamically, you want the le le least amount of force blowing at you, okay? So the first thing you need to do is you need to remove all your clothing. Um, see, as a believer, I need to remove things in my life that are hindering me from racing. Okay, um, it, the word the word weight here is not talking about sin, but sometimes there's certain things that we do that prevent us from being the people that God wants us to be. Um, I'm going to give you an example. To you, we're talking about this Friday, i.e., Facebook. Okay. How many hours, about hours, do some of us spend on the computer just blowing time away? And then when I ask, how much time have you spent with God? This, no, I, haven't, I haven't spent any time because I've been too busy. But you know that what they're doing. And, and, and you know, a lot of us blow a lot of time and waste a lot of energy on things that we really, it's just distractions, and there's just weights and things that hinder us and prevent us from being able to run the race properly. You know, so first thing we need to do is look and see what are the things that are preventing me from running that race effectively. Okay, uh, I can run. I can run with my sweats on, but I'm not going to run effectively or efficiently with my sweats on. So there are things that are holding me back. I need to rid myself of those things. Okay. Secondly, I need to rid all sin of my life. Uh, let us lay aside, really literally means to rip off every weight and sin which clings so closely, okay? A lot of us also carry a lot of sin with us, okay? Let's say the truth. You know, a lot of us, and including myself, there's areas in our life, that's, and there's always going to be areas in our life that we need to work on. Um, the difference is, are you working on it? Is it something that you're handing over to God? Or just something that you're, in, that you're enjoying, okay? Because sin, you know, is, is, you can enjoy sin for a season. But you remember, there's always repercussions and consequences to our sins. But if you want to run the race, you need to rip that sin out of your life, okay? If you want to run that race, 
efficiently, effectively, you need to rip that sin out of your life. The exuity, again, um, I'm going to bring up an example. I actually was talking about Al the other day. We were enjoying, sitting down enjoying a cup of coffee. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's funny because I, I, I was discussing the message to him and, and, uh, and Abraham. And, uh, and we, were, we were discussing John's message. And, and he asked me the question, why, you know, how is it that God was able to... Uh, Use Abraham. See, if you look at Abraham's example, there's a man that lied a couple times, right? John brought up this example how he lied, but then at the same time, the same man that was a liar and took his son and had the faith to put him on the altar and was ready to kill him. And you know, and it's something we discussed. But what, what, what you need to look at in Abraham's life, there's a large span of time. Okay, see. I look at my life. As Abraham was was 75 years old when God took him out of Quran, right? He was 35 years old. Excuse me, 75 years old when he was called out by God. He was 100 years old when he received the promised child, okay? So for those of us who think that we wait, and God makes, sometimes may, may make us wait and we get impatient, imagine waiting 25 years for that promise, okay? Um, in fact, it got to the point where, where they thought maybe God needs help, and, and again, and they used, and, and that's how Ishmael got into the picture, but God doesn't need help. He knew what he was going to do, and he knew what he was going to do with it. But he's 100 years old there. By the time he took Isaac and put him on the altar, that was 35, that was, he was probably 13 to 15 years old, so he was 25, 35, 40 years later, Okay. Now, I look at myself. I've been a believer since 1993. Um, so that makes 19 years, okay? I think back 19 years ago, I'm not the same person I was 19 years ago. You know? I was the same person I was five years ago, okay? My walk with the Lord is consistent and consistently growing towards the finish line where He wants me to be. It's never going to be perfect. But is consistently walking in the way that he wants me to walk, and that's that, that. That was the reason, and that's why Abraham was such a great man. Abraham grew in his faith in God, and and his and um, ultimately it got to the point where Abraham was able to take his son and put him on the altar and trust in God. We all we all ultimately want to get to that point. Not all not all of us may, may be there right now, but you have to start someday. You have to start today. You know, you can't wait for tomorrow. You can't, you, because we don't know. And you got to realize there's people watching us. You know, we, we say we're Christians in the workplace. I am a Christian in the workplace. I tell people, people are watching us. Same way I watch that pastor, people are watching you. And their example of what a Christian is, is the way you live your life. You know? Um, let me continue on here. Um, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Next key point is that the race of life is an endurance race, a marathon, okay? We're not talking about a sprint here, okay? Uh, I always envy the 100 meter uh, runners. Because 10 seconds, they were done for the day, okay? And, you know, I had to run the longer races, and it was more grindy. He knows when you run the long, I don't know if any of you ran, but when you run longer distance, those areas jog for like three miles, you feel, the, you start feeling that pain, and your muscles start cramping up, and, you know, it's, life is an endurance race, and you're gonna, you're gonna cramp up, and you're gonna have missteps, and you're gonna want to quit, because that's what happens. When you're running, you want to quit, because sometimes, uh, the pain just hurts so much. Um, we, we need to, you know, we can't give up. I guess we need to look to Jesus. We need to, you know, when those times in life come, we need to look to Jesus. We can't give up. This is an endurance race. And as an endurance race, again, we need to be in it for the long haul. You know? Um, you continue reading here in verse number two. Looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter 
of our faith. See, Jesus has to, she has to have a proper understanding of who Jesus is in the Bible, okay? A lot of people throw his name out loosely today, but we need to have a proper understanding of what the, what the Bible teaches about Christ and who he is. You know, uh, in the context of a race, Jesus is the one who has run the path before us and he offers the outstanding example of how the race is to be run. Okay, unlike the, like the example in chapter 11, Jesus ran the perfect race, okay? And he is our ultimate example. Um, we will never be able to run the way he did, but he is the one we look, look towards. Another thing that uh, the imagery of a race was, um, I, don't know, I, I know that whenever I would be prepared to run a race, you're always focused on the finish line, okay? And you're always focused, you always imagine yourself running the race, and winning the race. This is, this is the way I would, I would always imagine myself running the race, being in front, and winning the race. Um, see, my focus now is Christ. The finish line is Christ. Okay, when I get there, that's when I win. Okay, and my, and my you know, again, my eternal gift is salvation and eternity with Christ in heaven. That's what I worry about. That's what I care about. That is my focus. That should be our focus. Jesus Christ should be our focus. During anxious times, during hard times, you know, no matter what's going on, because there are going to be obstacles, you know, there are going to be obstacles in, 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 in life, but Jesus is the one who's going to get us around those obstacles, okay? Yeah. When you have the anxious times in life, and things get tough, and you know what? It doesn't matter what the world thinks. <clears throat> Don't submit to their desires and how they want you to conform. Just focus on Christ. He will get you through it. He'll get us through those times, you know? The hard times of life. He's the only one. Um, Jesus not only perfected, but also provided the preeminent example of endurance because he looked beyond the immediate painful circumstances to the reward that was ahead. Okay. Um, anyone here, I, I want to finish you with a story. I have a story here that I, that I really enjoyed. Um, anyone here ever saw that movie, Chariots of Fire? Maybe too old for some of the kids. It actually came out in the early 80s, so maybe not, maybe the older crowd may know the know the movie. But um, I want to read the story. And for those who haven't seen it, it's a great movie. Um, I want to read a story about the person, the character of that movie, Eric Little. Uh, he was a Scottish, you know, uh, runner from uh, that ran for England in the uh, 1924 Olympics. So I, and just to show you the example of a person that's focused on Christ and living for Christ and has him as the ultimate finishing line, finish line in life. Um, the eighth Olympiad in modern times began in July 5th, 1924. It was held in the city of Paris, France. Over 45 countries were represented and the stadium swelled to a, to a crowd of 60,000 spectators. Among the competitors from Great Britain were Eric Little and Scott a Scot with wings on his feet. He came under the shadow of controversy. As a Christian, Little held the conviction that he should not run on Sunday, which is considered the, which he considered the Sabbath. Months before the Olympic Games, Little informed the Great Britain Olympic Committee that he would not be able to participate in the preliminary heat for the 100-meter run, which was his best event and the one he trained for for many years. As the Olympics drew near, the criticism, criticism of Little's fanaticism increased, and he doggedly refused. As Harold Abrams ran the 100-meter preliminary, Eric Little preached to a congregation in Scotts Kirk, another part of Paris. Abrams went on to win the final in their race and set a world record that would stand for 56 years. On the following Tuesday, Little and Abraham both qualified for a place in the 200 meter final to be held on the following day. Eric became the first Scott ever to bring home in that race, a, 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 the first Brit to win a bronze medal. Um, no other British person ever placed higher. Uh, Eric went on to com complete the 400 meter race, joining ra race uh, runners from Canada and went down the line shaking his competitors' hands as a ritual and he made familiar over time. And so he's ready to run the 400 meter race, which is a race that wasn't his race. 
but he ran it because he wasn't able to run the race that uh, he had trained for so many years. And as the gun shot, Eric bolted into a three meter lead and the race progressed. Finch, the American, began close on the Scott, but Little increased his speed. As he crossed the finish line with a five meter lead, he cocked his head back and arms flailing in the air. Remember the movie, he used to flail all over the place when he ran. Eric brought home the gold medal. After the explosive roar, the British spectators, a hush, finally went over all the crowd and they awaited the official time. The cheers erupted again when they announced that Eric Little has set a new world record at 47.6 seconds, which is one lap around the track. See, Eric Little was a sprinter as an Olympian, but as a young believer in, of Scotland, at 22 years old, during the Olympics, he provided a perfect example of someone, um, a Christian example of a person who ran with the marathon, marathoners endurance, okay? You can read his story and you can see that he says, wow. You know, you can make a movie about this, which they did. And that's how they ended the movie. But when you read up on Eric Little's life, his life didn't end there. Right after the Olympics, he became a missionary to China. And um, not long after he became a missionary in China, he was thrown in prison. And um, sadly, he died in the prisons in China for his faith. See? Um, if, if we learn anything from the life of Eric Little, you know, you learn that he was a man that looked to Christ no matter what, see, no matter what the result, he looked to Christ. He was called to be a missionary to, to uh, China. A lot of people may say, wow, he died there. He made the wrong, he made the wrong mistake. He made the wrong choice. No, he made the right choice. That's where, that, that was where God wanted him. We're still talking about him today, okay? Um, that's where God wants you. know, where does God want you? You need to ask yourself. See, where he wants you may not be always a place of comfort, okay? It may not be, might be always a place where you're going to be glorified for winning a 400-meter race where you get a gold medal. See, winning gold medals, you know, was great for him here. But, see, what people don't realize, Eric Little's race was beyond his realm, okay? It was beyond the visible, it was in the invisible. And we need to realize that uh, as we walk with, you know, with Christ in our daily lives. I'm gonna ask you guys to please bow your heads.